evening. My name is Barry Smith. I'm the director of the Institute of Philosophy. And before we hand over to the chair for this evening, my colleague, Dr. Afila Dawa, let me just welcome the 2016 Chandaria Laureate, Professor Andy Clark from the University of Edinburgh. The series of lectures that we hold annually for the Chandaria Laureate are the result of um, very generous support, our, as are many of our activities at the Institute of Philosophy, because of the generous support of Dr. Shamil Chandaria, for which we are very grateful. And we also have used this series as a way of promoting discussion of the philosophy of mind and the science of mind by people who we feel have made a contribution to both whether coming from philosophy or for, from science, we feel that they have moved on the field or moved on the discussion and the interaction, the significant interaction between these two disciplines. So we are very happy to continue in this series, which started with Dan Dennett and was followed by Stephen Neal and Colin Blakemore and Dan Sperber, Arturo Galesi, and I'm very pleased to announce that next year's Chandaria Laureate will be Celia Hayes. But this year, we are going to hear from and we are going to celebrate Andy Clark, whose work is known to many of you. Andy is perhaps one of the most innovative and original thinkers in the philosophy of mind who can contribute incisively and insightfully to our understanding of the mind by drawing on the recent signs, but also, I think, advancing it with ways of understanding and relating it to preoccupations and concerns that we've long held and had in philosophy. Many of you know the theses associated with Andy's name, including the extended mind, but the idea of embodiment, extension, <coughs> embeddedness, uh, and externalism are all part of the package that has shaped his thinking. He has come in and out of the, the closeness to the body and the mind through some of his work, but um, we're very glad now to be hearing the latest part of this, which draws on his thinking on predictive coding. But let me also remind you of the, the books, many of which have had a uh, a long and lasting influence on contemporary discussions, associative engines, being there, mind where, natural born cybergs, supersizing the mind, and most recently surfing uncertainty. And in this series of lectures called um, Prediction and the Embodied Mind, we're going to hear his latest thoughts starting tonight with prediction machines. And the on our behalf, let us welcome you to the Chandari Lectures. Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's wonderful to be here. Um, thanks for having me. Thanks to, um, to Barry and Ophelia for, for doing all kinds of stuff. Thanks to Shamil Chandaria for making it possible. Um, there's also a long list of, of intellectual thanks. Um, Carl Friston, top of that list, Jakob Hui, very close behind, and then Anil Seth, and a bunch of other people who I won't name. Um, but I've had lots and lots of help with this stuff, and, um, and of course, as usual, whatever's wrong is surely not. I'd also like to just put in a word for my mum. Um, when I was about to deliver these before, my mum died in April uh, of 2016, as so I had to cancel one run of these lectures due to a sort of surprising kind of whirlpool of grief and administration that sort of settled upon me. And so, just a, a, a quick word for my mother. Okay. So, what am I going to do? Um, so, these are three talks um, in kind of descending order of empirical evidence. Um, so I'm starting off today with uh, just a talk about the core idea, predictive processing, a core story about perception. It'll be familiar to some of you, so apologies for that. If it's very familiar, um, just bear with me. I think as I work my way through the three lectures, it should all get a bit less familiar. Um, today I think we're on fairly solid empirical ground. In the next lecture, 
I think we're on less solid empirical ground. We extend the story to action, argue that that alters the picture, and uh, look at the real fit or lack of it with embodied cognition. I think there's a real deep fit here, but that's what I'll want to um, explore in the second talk. And then in the last one, with ever decreasing empirical evidence, um, we have the question whether this can tell us anything about the big stuff, like emotions, consciousness, motivation. Um, could it really be a grand unified theory of the mind? Sometimes this approach is touted as perhaps, you know, perhaps a, a contender at least for a grand unified theory of everything cognitive, everything mental. Um, could that possibly be the case? What sort of unity could we be talking about there? Is it maybe the kind of unity that is only bought at the cost of trivializing the notion of prediction? That's a, a fair worry, and, uh, and we'll come back to it. So that's the plan anyway. Um, today, just get the, the core story on the table, sample the evidence, and flag some issues. Can everyone hear me? I don't know if this is, is this all right. Cool. Okay. So, and here are the conclusions, by the way. So there's no need to, you know, no need, uh, no need for any suspense. The conclusions are, I think, that treating the brain as being in the business of prediction, most fundamentally, is actually probably a game changer for thinking about the embodied mind. What we see, what we do, and what we feel might all depend on what we expect to see, what we expect to do, and what we expect to feel. Although the we in there is going to need some careful unpacking, because it's certainly not just the kind of top-level conscious you. It's a much more um, complicated prediction machine, most of whose worries and grindings you don't know anything about. So, you know, the, the sheer scope and sweep of this does pose challenges. I'll, I'll keep coming back to those. On the bright side, I think, this is one reason I like it, I think it's got the potential to bring something like um, the lived human image and the scientific, the cognitive scientific image, closer together than ever before. <coughs> I think as we sort of start to think about the mind in these ways, again and again we kind of recognize ourselves in there. We think, yeah, that's kind of what it's like to be a, to be a human being. <coughs> so, I'm going to start with the, the, basic, the basic picture. Um, the basic picture here is a, a, an attempt to turn a kind of fairly standard picture of perception upside down. So it's a picture that you might perhaps get from Descartes, you know, I'm not a Descartes scholar. Descartes was probably more um, <coughs> subtle, subtle than this, but there's a kind of reading of Descartes where you might think it's like this. And there's a sort of common sense picture that goes like this. Look, perception is about the sort of passive imprinting of how the world is on some kind of fairly malleable um, receptor system. And it's sort of been there in neuroscience as well. This is the sort of picture that you get in a lot of neuroscience texts. Uh, the arrows kind of going inward from the retina through many stages of processing um, without having all the backward arrows, which would actually be about 80% of the, of the work if they were put in. So, um, so the picture's there, as um, Edgar and colleagues, no fans of, uh, of that picture, say, on traditional accounts, the visual system was a, seen as a passive analyzer of bottom-up sensory information. As a kind of picture you might get out of David Marr as well. So if you have that notion of a, a, a kind of progression in which you're sort of refining the information stage by stage, getting more and more complex, get into the 3D model if you're lucky. No, no, quite got it. So I think this is a sort of view, slightly caricatured, caricatured view, but you know, good to, good to get us moving. Uh, a view of the perceiving brain as kind of passive, sort of sitting there waiting for stimuli to come along, and when they come along, those stimuli get put in one end of the sausage machine, progressively processed, um, and then uh, bubble up to the surface as kind of um, thoughts and percepts and so on. So this is a kind of cognitive couch potato view, I think, of, uh, of the brain. The brain just sits there, waiting for stuff to arrive, and when stuff arrives, the sausage machine activates, it does quite a lot of processing, and then you get to perceive the world. So what PP does, predictive processing does, what these stories do, and there's a bunch of sort of subtly different flavors of these stories, and well, we'll come to more of that as I go along. Um, but what that does is kind of turns that feed-forward picture upside down. So in these stories, perception mostly works from the top down. The idea is that the job of perception is to predict the present sensory signal. So it's important, I think, for today's um, sketch 
But when we think about prediction, we don't really think about looking into the future. Because this is actually about predicting the present. This is about predicting the current sensory barrage, if you like, knowing everything that you know about the world. So brains like that are, are kind of proactive. This is sort of, um, you know, this kind of goes very well with recent interest in resting state activity and kind of move towards active vision, active perception in cognitive science. I think this sort of picture is a kind of, um, is a kind of culmination and integration of all of those perspectives. So the idea is that brains like that are trying to predict the present sensory signal from the top down using what they know about the world, basically using probabilistic knowledge about the world. When they can do that, the thought is, then you get to perceive the world. And I'll try and argue um, that kind of perception is actually a kind of understanding. So we here make inroads into the question, you know, what is it to understand the world? Where does aboutness come from? And at the same time, you end up being in position to imagine the world and to act in it too. So there's a kind of interesting cognitive package deal there where perception, a kind of understanding, a kind of imagination all come along together. That at least is what I, I want to get on the table today. Okay. And every now and then there's a dark slide so that I might sort of take a breath and uh, fall. <laughs> I know I tend to go too quick. Okay, so there are, there are two key elements to this sort of story. Um, the first is that perception and action, but action <coughs> next time around, depend on the learning and use of probabilistic generative models. So I'll say what they are. And second, that perception and action depend on trying to use those models to predict the current sensory signal <coughs> leaving only unexplained bits of the signal to drive further processing. And that's a kind of predictive coding um, bit of the story. So there are kind of two moving parts here. There's the central role for probabilistic generative models, and then the idea that the way that you use them is this kind of predictive coding way. And it's clear enough, I think, that the second bit here is more contentious than the first. At this point, I don't think there's much doubt, really that brains use probabilistic generative models somewhere in the process of perceiving the world. But I think there's plenty of doubt about whether or not um, um, predictive coding in the rather specific sense that I'll be using it uh, is the way that they do it. Okay. So, generative models, informal introduction. Um, this will be fairly, fairly brief. I'm sure some of you know a lot more about probabilistic generative models than I do. Um, but this is the way that, uh, this is a nice little story from Dan Dennett. He gave me permission some years ago when I was kind of hiding out in his, in his farmhouse from Hurricane Irene, I think it was, in summer. We, we, we'd gone to try and go sailing as a hurricane, you couldn't go sailing. So you hung out in the farmhouse instead. This story came up, and uh, Dan said, You can have this story, use it anytime. So, okay, so this is um, a true story. A famous paleontologist, who Danny won't name, once complained to Dennett that his students cheated at their stratigraphy homework. So he probably knows stratigraphy of those sort of geological drawings, the sort of massed strata um, of, of uh, a geological sort of slice. Uh, so the thought was that uh, the students were just finding a picture of these sort of massed strata online, maybe tracing it, and then claiming to understand when really they didn't. So these are the sorts of pictures you, you, you've all seen. It literally means the drawing of layers, and it's supposed to, to reveal the way complex physical structure accrues over time. So what Dennett imagined, and um, to, to the credit of the whole uh, team there, this wasn't just a philosopher's imagination. Um, they actually got a software engineer to build this, and then people in paleontology used it, and apparently found it good. Um, they imagined a 1980s software package that was called Slice. And Slice was a kind of user interface with a number of virtual knobs. So it's a little bit like a, an Etch-a-Sketch, um, which some of you have played with. I'm old enough to remember the Etch-a-Sketch. But with an Etch-a-Sketch, you can actually make lines appear on the screen where you want them. You can pretty well sort of control it pixel by pixel, as it were. Um, but with the, the software package that Dan imagined and that um, the software engineer built, each knob didn't control anything as basic as that. Instead, it controlled the, un the simulated unfolding of a basic geological process. So you would have a knob that would, for example, deposit layer of sediment. 
a knob that would intrude lava, a knob that would control fracture, a knob that would control erosion. So let's uh, arm just with those knobs now. You can kind of imagine where this goes probably. Uh, the thought now is, now your homework is to actually you give them the stratigraphy drawing and they have to reproduce it using this machine. So they're given the drawing, they can't just sort of copy it anymore, they've just been given it, uh, but they have to reproduce it using only the knobs and twiddlings made available by Slice, this machine. So that's the homework. Um, it's clear that you can't do it by tracing or copying, you don't have control over it like that, you know, you don't have pixel level control, the knobs only do stuff like fracture, intrude, um, intrude lava, etc. And so the device forces you to twiddle the right geological hidden cause knobs in the right order to bring about the picture that you've been given. So the kind of thought is, and I think it's rather compelling, is that if you can do that, then you really do understand a lot about how geological hidden causes, if you like, get together to create a particular outcome, the one represented by one of those, um, one of those stratigraphy drawings. Oh, I don't know why. Oh, but, uh, there we go. Yes. So, of course, there's lots of different ways to bring about um, a particular geological outcome, and some of those ways are more plausible than others. So what you really want the student to do is to find the, the set of knob twiddlings that are the most probable hidden causes of that particular picture. And then you could make the homework a little bit fancier if you wanted. You could say, okay, I'm going to rule out the normal, most probable set of causes, now the student's job is to find the second most probable set of causes, and so on. So you can see at this point the student has to, um, the student has to command a probabilistic generative model, not just a generative model. So is that sort of, is that kind of, that sort of makes sense, I think. The kind of picture here is, if the student can reproduce what they've been, if they can reproduce a sort of raw picture by twiddling these knobs, then they do understand a lot about how geological hidden causes get together to bring about particular outcomes. Okay. I've said all that bit, so I should go right ahead. Next step in this story, it's an <laughs> obvious step, you need to eliminate the student. It's always a favorite step. So now think not about slice, but think about auto slice. Auto slice is just like slice, but it commands its very own multi-level probabilistic model of how geological stuff gets together to bring about the kinds of outcomes represented in one of those stratigraphy drawings. So auto-slice has to account for, as you might say, explain away the sensory data, the picture that it's been given, by self-generating it by twiddling these knobs. And this, the thought is, this is a, a one domain, very, very slimline version of the thing that the brain is doing all the time in order to deal with the incoming sensory mirage. The idea is that what you've got in your head is a set of knobs, in effect, that you have to twiddle in order to match the incoming sensory barrage with an apt set of top-down predictions that would reconstruct that sensory data for yourself using what you know about the world. So that's the thought. Successful perception might just be like a very, very big auto slice. The incoming sensory signal needs to be matched, courtesy of a bunch of um, local or the recurrent message passing by a good flow of top-down prediction. And then you can uh, put in the predictive coding bit. That would be this next bit. As the match proceeds, some populations of cells send predictions downwards, and others send prediction errors upwards. And prediction errors would, well, and whenever I say downwards, please hear downwards and sideways. And when I say upwards, please hear upwards and sideways. Because um, then it's right. Uh, so information about mismatches with the current prediction would be sent sideways and upwards. So when all that works, when you can actually make that match work, then, if these stories are right, that's when you, as an agent, have a stable, what I'll call a stable world revealing percept. Um, I think that's kind of important. There might be ways in which some creatures get to grips with the world without doing stuff like this. You know, you could be a, you could be a single-celled organism following um, 
following a sugar trail or something like that. And it's not obvious to me that you have to be mixing together top level um, hidden causes in order to match the income in sensory barrage in order to do that. This is something that we'll um, eventually come back to. So I think this is a kind of perception that is um, paradigmatically a, a sort of higher perception. This is a kind of perception that brings a structured world into view that the creatures are having. Okay, so predictive coding, next bit of this. Idea is that given that you do have some mechanism doing this or trying to do this top-down prediction thing, then whenever it's working, you can just take all that stuff for granted. Whenever the top-down prediction is right, don't do anything about it. So all you need to use to drive further processing would be mismatches, residual errors. So this is a familiar predictive coding sort of story that you get from commercial predictive coding. Um, you know, kind of data compression technique so that you don't need to you don't need to send all the information that's in the next frame of a motion compressed video. All you need to do is send the difference between the way that that frame would be if it was the same as the last frame. Um, and if you if you process that difference, then you've got the next frame at a much lower cost. So that's a, that's a sort of predictive coding element here. What you want to do is just focus on what carries the news. There will be prediction errors residual errors, mismatches with what's predicted, that's what carries the news, you don't have to carry, care much about anything else. So prediction error turns out to be the sort of a, the kind of a, a big player in these stories. I think this is one of, the, one of the core empirical claims here, is that in many, many cognitive domains, prediction error will turn out to be a much bigger player than we previously thought. Prediction error is actually sometimes said here, Feldman and Priston say this, it replaces the flow of incoming sensory information. So whereas you might have thought, you know, with Descartes and common sense, that you've got a, a flow of incoming sensory information, now maybe we should think about it as what you've got a flow of really is error. You've got a flow of the mismatches between your best current top-down prediction and the incoming sensory information. Of course, that's still sensory information. Well, you know, it's still information. Um, it's in fact just the information that you ought to care about. And then there's a, a kind of thought that in mammalian brains, this actually occurs courtesy of a multi-level, multi-area cascade of um, cortical processing. And there's some classic references there. I'll, I'll stick more references up at the, at the end. Processes like this turn out to be computationally feasible. There are lots of small-scale simulations. And I think maybe crucially, there are now increasingly detailed proposals for implementation. So there's a, a nice paper by Bastos and colleagues here trying to come up with a sort of implementation level canonical micro circuit that might be um, repeated throughout the cortex that could do this. It's also, and this is um, now looking ahead a bit at, um, at the set of talks two and three, there's a lot of talk at the moment and a lot of work at the moment about bring in other stuff into this story. So what starts off as a story about cortical processing might end up being a story that includes much more ancient stuff, subcortical, limbic stuff. The thought would be that all that stuff is also part of this big sort of ball game of um, generating and gating, in particular, um, prediction error information, setting the precision, the weighting of prediction error information, gating that information, Maybe that's the sort of stuff that a lot of um, subcortical structures are, are busy doing. So there is a bold unifying claim, and by the, by the last talk I'll have it on the table, the bold unifying claim is that, um, that this trick, this trick of using downward prediction to meet the incoming sensory barrage and letting errors drive further processing, might be the fundamental operating principle of the brain itself. So it's, um, you know, nothing if not if not ambitious. Okay. Uh, sort of thing that you might worry about, you might say, well, surely we need to perceive the world already if we're going to learn a model that predicts the flow of incoming sensory information. Um, I don't think that's right. I mean, you certainly need to be able to receive information from the world already, but you don't need, I think, to be able to perceive it already. So. Um, Worth noticing here that the prediction <coughs> task is really, really good 
for sort of bootstrapping your way to knowledge. So you try and predict stuff, and as you fail to predict it, um, you can you will generate um, prediction error signals, but those prediction error signals can now drive plasticity in the model itself so that you progressively learn a better and better model of what's out there, a model able, better able, to get rid of um, prediction error. So, for example, if you want to predict the next word in a sentence, it's of course good to know about grammar and other stuff. But a good way to learn a surprising amount about grammar is to try again and again and again to predict the next word in sentences. So, using gradient descent learning, you can get quite a long way by trying to do that. So what that means is that you can use the prediction task to bootstrap your way to the grammar that you then use in the prediction task in future. So there's no sort of, um, there's nothing up the sleeve here. It's kind of all prediction. Prediction can drive learning, and prediction can then deal with perception. It's probably worth noticing that I don't think predictive processing, as I use it anyway, <coughs> takes any stance on nativism versus empiricism. You can build as much knowledge or as little knowledge into these systems at the start as you want to. So either you start off predicting a bunch of stuff, or you start off predicting less stuff and tune by prediction error. Um, it's also true, and I'll just maybe get to this in discussion um, at some point, uh, that you can even think, this is something that Carl Friston has been doing lately, is thinking about the actual sort of gross structure of the brain as itself a kind of prediction. So, you know, you, know, you have a dorsal and a ventral visual stream, or maybe that is a, it's a kind of sedimented prediction about the way that statistical regularities are distributed in the kind of world we inhabit. In general, for example, um, uh, the identity of stuff can be constant across movement. And so you want to perhaps code movement one way and identity another way. <laughs> okay, so at this point, as a philosopher, I get to wave my hand. Um, now, what I get to say is, okay, there was a little picture of how, um, how perception might work and how you might learn the probabilistic generative model. Now just imagine this on a very, 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 very big scale. To predict text, learn about words and letters and strokes and eventually meanings too. To predict other kinds of players' sensory data at all kinds of other scales of space and time, learn about interacting hidden causes like football games, goals, tables, chairs, faces, people, hurricanes, intentions, everything that is part of our, our human ontology. So maybe that's how a structured meaningful world comes into view, by trying to predict the barrage of sensory information again and again and again. So summary so far, the idea is perception, this particular kind that I want to focus on, rich world revealing perception if you like, occurs when the downward cortical and maybe subcortical cascade generates the sensory data for itself using a, a bunch of probabilistic models. When that happens, you perceive the world. It recalls, I think, the slogan that I first heard from Max Klaus, the vision scientist, um, also um, being attributed to Ramesh Jain. I don't really know where it comes from to begin with. If anyone does know, I always ask this. But if anyone really knows, let me know. The slogan that perception is controlled hallucination. So you might say, your brain's trying to guess what's out there. To the extent that that guess matches the incoming sensory barrage, you get to perceive the world. And of course, this kind of process can also um, mislead. So there's a, a misleading case, a hollow mask illusion. I think most of us have heard about that, but not everyone's actually seen one in the, in the sort of semi-flesh, and there it is in the semi-flesh. Um, if you're sort of sitting in the right quadrant of the room, you should see the face coming out at you, um, but of course there isn't a face coming out at you, and if I stick my hand in it, it might go away. I don't know. What you get in there. If I turn it upside down, but then it's all too complicated, it would also go away. Um, so what's going on there? Well, one um, persuasive account, I think, is that you have a very, very strong prediction that faces are going to be convex with noses sticking outwards. And that, um, that prediction is here trumping some elements of the sensory input. So because you've got such a strong prediction that noses are going to come out, that faces have this kind of form, um, then you're in effect treating the other information as noise. So you're damping the other information, you're amplifying. 
um, some other bits of information. This is uh, this is Bjorn Borg in the same uh, same kind of setting. I wanted, I wanted Bjorg rather than um, rather than Einstein, but I couldn't get it. <laughs> so I think that the you know the hollow mask illusion shows how top-down predictions can dampen some bits of the sensory signal while enhancing others. And why are they doing that? Well, to reveal the kind of stuff that matters to a creature like us. And I think next time when I look at action, that notion of mattering will get a much better unpacking, because it will basically be what matters for the kind of stuff that we need to do. Um, but of course, if, if this story is right, then that's not a curiosity. This is what brains do all the time, not just in kind of slightly weird cases like hollow mask illusions or whatever. It's tempting, I think, to say that human brains are there to walk reality in the service of human needs. I'm tempted enough to say that, but, uh, but I'm not quite tempted enough to, um, to say it without saying it's just tempting to say it. <laughs> <coughs> Um, that illusion, the hollow mask illusion, that effect is diminished in schizophrenia and under the influence of some drugs, and that's interesting, and some folk in predictive processing world are trying to give um, sort of, uh, sort of um, disturbances to prediction balances accounts of, of how that happens. And we'll look at some of those in the, in the third, third talk. So there's another way of showing what a big difference good top-down prediction can make. I'm going to play you these little clips of sine wave speech. Um, some of you will have heard these before. The sine wave speech is a sort of skeletal version of ordinary speech. So it's speech with a lot of the ordinary um, acoustic characteristics stripped out. So you're just left with a skeleton that to most people sounds a bit like the clangers, which I think this audience might know the clangers. Um, doesn't work in America. Um, there you go, so it's going to work here. So let's play some. So what you're going to hear is the stripped down version. Then you're going to hear the actual sentence. Then you'll hear the stripped down version again. And what you should notice is that um, as your brain, as it were, rapidly acquires a good model, then you can see through the noisy sensory information to the, um, to the hidden causes that are actually bringing it about, namely strings of words. So here we go, a little bit of luck. Only one. It was a sunny day and the children were going to the park. It was a sunny day and the children were going to the park. It was a sunny day and the children were going to the park. You should hear a big difference. We'll do this a couple more times because it's fun. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. The camel was kept in a cage at the zoo. He was sitting at his desk in his office. He was sitting at his desk in his office. He was sitting at his desk in his office. The police returned to the museum. The police returned to the museum. The police returned to the museum. Yeah, yeah. Well, Barry is a native speaker of sign, obviously, and probably rather like that region. <laughs> yeah. so, um, so, of course, what you're seeing there, you, you've got a generative model that is almost ready to do that already. And that's why you can, as it were, pick this up with kind of one-shot learning. And a couple of goes, and you're probably getting close to being a native sign speaker. So probably after a few more, you'd be able to just do these just like Barry can. Um, some way hidden away, I've got the, the version of the three bears, which is very, very hard to get. Um, but, uh, okay. So I think that the, the kind of thought there is that difference, the difference that you're experiencing there, is a difference between, as it were, a, a, a prediction unready brain encountering a sensory barrage and a prediction enriched brain encountering the same sensory barrage. And the prediction enriched brain um, when it encounters that sensory barrage, brings a structured world of interacting, humanly relevant hidden causes, spoken words, into view. <coughs> so, have a quick look at evidence, then raise a couple of problems, and then stop. Um, is there any evidence that um, anything like this goes on in the, in the brain? Anything like the particular sort of um, picture that I was giving you? Well, there's been 
quite a few fMRI type studies now. There's a classic one, first one probably in 2002, revealed these sorts of relationships as higher visual areas slowly settled into interpretation of what shapes out there. Activity in lower visual areas, V1 in particular, became significantly dampened, reduced. Kind of explanation there is well, it's dampened because um, prediction error has now been resolved. Um, prediction error is not flowing forward through the <coughs> system now. Perhaps quite a lot of the, a lot of what you see in fMRI, thinking EEG actually, is prediction error signals. So when you see less, perhaps what you're seeing less of is prediction error. Lots more results like that. Title of this one kind of says it all. Stimulus predictability reduces responses in primary visual cortex. Um, nice work by Lars Muckley in Glasgow. He reports that well-predicted stimuli, although they're able to drive better and faster behavioral responses, show reduced fMRI activation in V1. So that's kind of showing this sort of efficiency payoff of being a good prediction machine. He says finding reduced activity related to increased performance fits well with the predicted coding framework, but it is difficult to explain otherwise. I think that's right. So another nice paradigm here is repetition suppression. It's, uh, it's well known that stimulus evoke neural activity, the, the, the measured response to a repeated visual or auditory um, stimulus or cue, is reduced if you repeat it. So you, know, you get a response, repeat the thing, and you get less response. So it's a very nice experiment, Summerfield and colleagues, manipulated the likelihood of repetition itself. Um, so what they showed is that the repetition suppression effect is itself reduced when repetition is established to be less likely by manipulating the local likelihoods. Um, so that's rather nice. That shows that something that you might have thought was just like, I don't know, cell fatigue or something. There are these sort of standard um, kind of very physiological accounts of, of um, of repetition suppression, but actually um, it might be a, a much fancier effect than that, one that is very sensitive to the, to the probability that the stimulus is going to be or isn't going to be repeated. Yes, yes I guess. So, next we could consider, and I, I like this one especially, um, you could consider evoke responses that are tracking emissions. So these are evoke responses which are responding to what isn't there. That's interesting. This is the kind of thing that I think is going to be very, very, very hard to explain without thinking that the brain is in the business of modeling the world and using that to predict the sensory input. So it shows the brain predict, predicting, detecting, I should say, a very specific absence, and I don't see how we can explain this without prediction. You know, detecting a specific absence means you must have predicted that specific thing. You know, how else could you detect a specific absence? You can think about them. Yeah, okay, that's what I'm trying to say. So there's a nice little simulation of this, um, Adams and colleagues, 2013. They use a, a, a simple predictive processing um, computer simulation to show this sort of effect using um, simulations of birdsong. So, Multi-layer prediction machine operating using exactly the sort of probabilistic generative model prediction error driven um, update that we were describing. Um, processes sequences of simulated bird chirps. The simulations are then repeated, but you emit the last three chirps of the signal. And then this is the less interesting bit of it, but still interesting. At the first missing chirp, you get a big burst of prediction error. So, you know, you're expecting it to go, I don't know, du, 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 it goes, du, 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 nothing, and then you get a big burst of prediction error. That's kind of what, what you would expect, although it's still good evidence. Um, kind of gives you a, a picture maybe of the so-called mismatch negativity, the signature neuronal response associated with oddballs, unexpected and omitted items. Okay. Worth noticing, by the way, that EEG studies are most sensitive to the kinds of responses that in attempts to describe plausible implementations of PP would be most strongly associated with prediction error signals, um, namely superficial pyramidal cell firings. Right, but more interesting, at the exact moment when the first missing chirp should have occurred, um, as it were, just before that big burst of prediction error, 
you get the start of the response that would have been generated had the third chirp actually happened. So that's what I think is really interesting. You get this brief transient illusory percept as of the chirp coming along, and then because there's no chirp there and you're a good information processor, it's like, oh dear, no, it's not there. Now you get the big burst of prediction error. Okay. So that's good, I think. That's interesting. Um, the network first has this sort of hallucination of the missing chirp, then a big peak of prediction error. I think you can compare this to some sort of um, things that we're probably familiar with. You sort of think about just starting to see your recently deceased dog enter the room when the curtain moves a certain way. You kind of, you kind of start to see it enter. And they think, oh no, that's no, not there. You know, dog died or something. Um, but you know, maybe this isn't just a grief-based malfunction. Maybe this is just more evidence of the, of the perceptual system doing what it should do, which is to say, um, using what it knows about the world in quite deep levels to try to predict the incoming stimulations. Of course, you know that your dog's dead, so this raises a certain issue about, as it were, where you fit into this picture at all, and that's something that I'll come back to in the, in the third talk. Okay, so maybe this is actually just the prediction machinery doing what it should do, treading this fine line between, um, between efficiency, on the one hand, that's like use the predictions, and then the danger of that is hallucinations, false positives, um, etc. So, three. Okay, so now I get to put the last bit of the apparatus on the table, raise a couple of questions, a uh, couple of worries, and then stop. Last bit of the apparatus, the core apparatus, is a, a mechanism for walking that delicate line between, if you like, um, efficiency and hallucination. So to walk that delicate line, these models make an awful lot of use of, um, of precision weighting. Precision weighting here is the weighting of prediction error. So it corresponds statistically to the inverse variance of the prediction error. You can see it as, if you like, sticking the error bars around your own prediction error signal. So that means that there are three quantities in play in these systems. There are predictions, prediction errors, and the weighting of prediction errors, mostly called precision. And that third quantity gets to be varied according to how reliable, um, how certain or uncertain different aspects of the signal are taken to be. So what that means really is that, you know, if it's, a, if it's a foggy day, then you don't want to take vision too seriously, downgrade um, the value of prediction error signals associated with vision so they don't get to drive the processing as strongly as they would have otherwise. Um, perhaps upgrade the value of prediction errors associated with audition because maybe now you're relying a bit more on sound than you would have been otherwise. Um, visual Prediction, visual prediction error, same thing here, should be given high weight when you visually attend in good light to uh, the detail of an image, nice old coin. So what this does is it, it, it means that you don't just get dampening out of this. So you, you might kind of think, and it was a, an early worry about these systems, um, in, uh, in response to Ram Ballard's classic paper, um, Koch and somebody else, his name I've forgotten, uh, raised the worry that, uh, you know, silence, <coughs> surely isn't always golden, you know, you're not always <coughs> looking to sort of suppress. What you often want to do is enhance select aspects of the signal. But precision weighting allows you to do exactly that. So that means that this framework can display both the su suppression of what's well predicted, but the enhancement of whatever's estimated to be important, basically, important and or reliable. And there's some very nice fMRI MVPA work that shows exactly that pattern. Um, highly recommended, I'll go through it here. Okay. So I think this is usually good news. It means that um, we can still see very surprising things when we assign high weight to, for example, visual prediction error. Um, if, the, if I suddenly unveil the surprising elephant, which I didn't bring, I brought the thing, I should have brought the surprising elephant as well. If I had brought one and suddenly unveiled it, You'd all be able to see it. You might get a quick burst of prediction error. You kind of didn't think that there was going to be anything there. But you set you know, high value on visual prediction error, and so you're able to use it to recruit your best hypothesis about what's out there, which is 
unexpected elephant behind the podium or something. Okay. So what that means is that the, the percept that overall best minimizes prediction error for me, the agent, could also be something that for me, the agent, is a very surprising state of affairs. Something that, as an agent, I would have said I didn't predict at all. So after the, the, the sort of flurry of properly weighted prediction error signals have been processed, the upshot can be that I'm in a state that I find highly surprising. But of course, in some important sense, my brain's not highly surprised. This is, like the, this is the least surprising thing that my brain could come up with that was out there. So the least surprising thing, if you want to think of it in those terms. So what do we say about the elephant? You know, where, where does that feeling of surprise come from? Probably it's a way of, of, of sort of keeping the agent in touch with the sort of distance between the prior and the posterior here. There's just more distance there than you expected. So the, the elephant, prior to the waves of highly weighted sensory information, was improbable. And maybe your feeling of surprise is a way of keeping that alive, because that's a good thing to know. Okay. So all that means is that the precision of sensory prediction errors Estimates of your own sensory uncertainty are huge players in these stories. Really, really, really major players. Such major players that by the end of the three sessions, you might be forgiven for thinking that it's doing too much work, that precision assignment has become a kind of magic bullet to solve all of our problems. Um, you can see how important it is, though, if you assign too much precision to sensory prediction error, you can't detect a faint pattern in a noisy world. You might actually think that this has something to say about autism, for example. It might be a case where assigning too much precision to sensory prediction error or too little to top-down prediction results in a, a kind of being overwhelmed by the sensory barrage. We'll come back to that later in the talks. But if you assign too little precision to sensory prediction error, then you'll start to hallucinate patterns that aren't there just because you strongly expect to see them. So, so you've got to get this balance just right. There are some classic experiments here. Um, undergraduate students, and I think they did it afterwards with non-undergraduate students, just to prove it wasn't just undergraduates. Um, they can be made to hear um, the famous song White Christmas by Bing Crosby starting when they've just been told, well, somewhere in this slightly noisy sound file, you're going to just, you know, there'll be White Christmas just starting to play, see if you can find it. Under those conditions, um, a large number of undergraduates, a properly significant number of their, of their cohort, did indeed detect the onset, or seemed to detect the onset of white Christmas, but it was just white noise. And of course, um, you can see this in the same way as the hollow mask illusion. Your strong expectation of white Christmas is now causing you to discard some bits of the sensory signal and amplify others, so you in effect carve your own white Christmas out of the signal. So a little bit like carving your own nose out of the air there. And of course, um, what that means is that mistakes in precision weighting will have really serious impacts on both what you see and ultimately on what you believe, because perception and understanding and cognition are all tied together here. It's what you know. What you know is what you use to meet the incoming sensory barrage, which in turn affects what you know, and this and what you believe. Um, and this is at the heart of Fletcher and Fritz's nice account of um, the origins of the, the positive symptoms of schizophrenia, that's to say delusions and hallucinations. You get a nice unified account of their co-emergence. Another example, um, hearing a familiar song playing on a poor radio receiver in the shower, the familiar song will seem to sound to you a lot clearer than the unfamiliar one. But if you had that sort of feed-forward framework, you might think this is some kind of add-on effect. You know, something that uh, maybe memory is adding something after you've actually heard the bad stuff. Or maybe it's uh, just a judgment effect, just seems to sound louder, uh, sound clearer. But I don't think that's what you should say if you take this story seriously. I think what you should say if you take this story seriously is that you really do hear the familiar song more clearly. You're the, the person is actually a better, clearer percept. Because that percept is constructed in just the same way as, um, as all other percepts here. It's just that 
if, you, if you're familiar with the song, you've got good priors in effect. So your predictions are good, so you can carve that song out of the sensory barrage better than you could with, um, without those priors. So I think what we should say there is that the familiar song really does sound clearer. It's not that familiarity makes a fuzzy percept seem clearer. It's not that memory later does some filling in. Instead, the percept itself is clearer. The percept is altered. This isn't just a philosopher's thought experiment. There is work out there showing that our predictions of other people's mental states influence where you think they're looking. So this is important in courtroom <coughs> settings, for example. If you think someone is guilty, you tend to think that they're directing their gaze perhaps away from the person that they putatively did stuff to. Um, but if you think that they're innocent, you think that their gaze is pointing somewhere else. So it's uh, quite, quite important. And we'll come back to these cases again later. I thought that was supposed to be a breathe. But not much time to breathe. They'll bring it in in about five minutes. So don't breathe. Implications. This inverts the traditional picture of perception in a sort of Bayesian way, I think. Instead of trying to build a model of what's out there on the basis of sensory evidence, you're trying to predict the sensory evidence on the basis of your best model of what's out there. So that's the kind of Bayesian flavor here. I think this is why we actually see a structured external world rather than just patterns of light and sound. Um, this is the sort of, this is the slice moral from earlier on. If what you're doing in order to perceive the world is mixing together um, representations of how hidden causes interact to bring about that sensory signal, then of course what perception is going to reveal is the hidden causes themselves. Stuff like um, masks and, uh, and microphones and cats and dogs. So I think the so-called transparency of perceptual experience that we seem to simply see tables, chairs, and bananas, seems to fall quite naturally out of this sort of story. I mentioned earlier that I think this brings perception and understanding very, very close together. Um, it means perhaps to make inroads into understanding intentionality and aboutness. When you perceive the world using these sorts of resources, you know a lot about how that situation is going to unfold. That's that's the prediction machinery. So that means that you understand stuff. <coughs> Perception and imagination come about at the same time because you're using top-down prediction to try and recreate the sensory barrage. So if you take away <coughs> the sensory barrage, you can still use that machinery to try and recreate what's not there. And maybe that's how you get imagination. And perhaps you can harness that for simulation-based reason that that's a that's a bridge further along. Okay, let's get to the couple of worries, and then I'll stop. So clearly this is going to be ambitious, you know. Um, if these stories are right, then the kind of scheme that I've been offering is a fundamental operating principle of the brain, and there are just three basic elements involved in all cognitive processing. Predictions, prediction errors, and their variable weightings. Well, you know, the generative model that gives rise to the predictions, but really three moving parts, predictions, prediction errors, and precisions. So there's a kind of contemporary cognitive alchemy, I think, but you know, the alchemists had four basic elements, and now you've only got three, so you're really, you're really struggling here. Come back to that one at the end. So lots of questions that we could raise. We could say, look, if all I'm trying to do, if all my brain's trying to do is minimize prediction error, why don't I just opt for a really, really, really boring life? Um, you know, what, what am I doing here? Um, how plausible is it that the brain has a fundamental operating principle anyway? Um, how do we test the claim that this is the fundamental operating principle of the brain? And where exactly does my predictions, my understandings as an agent fit into this? So those are all good questions. We'll come back to them all um, in subsequent talks. Um, also the one I mentioned earlier, can this really encompass, as it will by the end, perception, reason, action, emotion and experience without having to make prediction itself too much of a moving target? There are ways of understanding each of these things where you use talk about predictions, but it's a reasonable question whether you're using that talk in the same way in all of these cases. So we'll come back to that one too. 
But the only one I actually want to talk about today, just for the last two minutes, and I'll be done, because I know this is the time when I said if I get to five to seven, stop me. So, nearly there. Um, question. What does all this have to say about the nature of our perceptual contact with the world? Um, have we become a bit cut off from the world here? So, you know, as a good embodied, embedded, extended cognition kind of guy, I want us to be in touch with the world. I don't want the world to be kind of hidden away behind a deep inferential veil or anything like that. Um, so have I, you know, have I gone over to the dark side here? Um, I think it's all really yes and no. Um, people in this literature do speak very freely of perception as controlled hallucination. I used that earlier. They speak of the brain as generating a virtual reality or an inferred fantasy. These are all, um, all words that you'll find out there. Some of, some of them by uh, people in this room. Um, people say things like this for very good reasons because perceiving the world requires meeting the incoming sensory signal with a top-down model-based prediction. So, you know, that is creating a kind of virtual reality. But at the same time, this is a process that sorts out the signal from the noise when all's working well. So I think you can also see this as a way of sort of seeing through the sensory shadows on the wall of Plato's cave to the hidden causes, the humanly relevant hidden causes um, that are out there. So just a very quick example, think about hearing a sentence spoken in your native language. You hear words separated by gaps. But if you looked at the sound stream, that would turn out to be perfectly continuous. So those gaps are in some sense being added by you, the listener. So what you encounter when you hear my words as having gaps, not very big ones, I agree, gaps between them, uh, is in some way a construct. But that construct is tracking something very real and very humanly important. It's tracking real structure in the signal source, which is other agents who are producing strings of distinct, meaningful words. So I think that we, in this way, we use this kind of trick to see through the noisy, continuous, sometimes ambiguous sensory signal to the kind of stuff that matters for engaging the world, and this will be the subject of the next um, talk. In, in human ways. So I think this might be a good picture of perception in general. The world we encounter in perception is no more and no less a virtual reality or fantasy than the distinct words that you hear me after in with spaces between them now. So I think you can see this in a, in a more upbeat kind of um, more directly in contact with the world kind of way. Maybe this is perceptual openness for real agents operating in a noisy world. Um, so maybe I would think in terms of, not that um, perception is controlled hallucination, but the hallucination is uncontrolled perception. You could, you could play it that way. So I, I will stop there. Thank you.